to connect to sound. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 104th New Social Environment. Well, a thousand and fourth new social environment, actually. Um, I'm Chloe, Director of Programs here at The Rail, and I have the extreme privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Ashley James and Zoe Hopkins. And now I'll introduce Ashley and Zoe. Dr. Ashley James is Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum and the curator of Going Dark, the contemporary figure at the edge of visibility, the subject of today's dialogue. Prior to joining the Guggenheim, James served as Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art at Brooklyn Museum, where she was the lead curator for the museum's presentation of Soul of a Nation, Art in the Age of Black Power. She also organized Eric N. Mack, Let Me Walk Across the Room, and co-curated John Edmonds, A Sidelong Glance. She holds a PhD from Yale University in English Literature and African American Studies. And our host today, Zoe Hopkins, is a writer and critic based in New York. She received her BA in Art History and African American Studies at Harvard University and is currently working on her MA in Modern and Contemporary Art at Columbia University. Her writing has been published in the Brooklyn Rail, Art Forum, Cultured, and Hyperallergic. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Zoe. Thank you, Chloe, for that introduction. Um, it's so wonderful to be here and see faces and names in the room, in the Zoom room. Um, and Ashley, I'm of course just thrilled to um, sit down and chat with you about um, this thrilling exhibition that you've curated, Going Dark, um, which if anyone here hasn't had hasn't seen it yet, I highly, highly encourage everyone to do so um, while in New York. Um, but anyways, um, this is a real honor and treat for me. Um, and thank you for being here, Ashley. Thank you, Zoe. And thank you to the Brook and Rail team. Um, and special thanks to you, Zoe, for such an amazing review of the show. Um, I think I already said this in my own Instagram public way, but um, it's a real gift when critics take the time to really engage with the, the theory behind an exhibition and not just a kind of cursory um, overview. And um, for that, I very much appreciate your time and efforts. Of course. Well, you you made the conditions possible for me to do that and um, just laid the exhibition out with such clarity, precision, and acuity. So you made the work easy for me. Um, <laughs> um, so shall we dive into um, our conversation and the questions? Wonderful. All right. Um, so I had the chance to um, have a walkthrough with you and my class a couple of weeks ago. Um, and you described the exhibition in that context as being site specific. Um, and in the catalog, you also write of the Guggenheim um, Rotunda as a acutely idiosyncratic space in which to curate. Um, and so I was wondering if we could sort of talk first about the context that this exhibition is enveloped in, um, the space in which it is situated, the Guggenheim itself. Um, and so I wanted to ask this sort of fundamental question of how you were thinking about the architecture of the Guggenheim in relation to the exhibition's argument um, and how you were sort of hoping that the building itself, the installation tax tactics, the exhibition design might change the terms on which viewers engage with the subject of the exhibition and sort of vice versa. Um, how might viewers come, come to a changed understanding of the Guggenheim um, through, um, you know, traversing through going dark? Yeah, um, the... Thank you for that question. Um, for those who have um, been to the Guggenheim, it is uh, no surprise that um, it would be framed in, in my mind as a kind of unique architectural challenge um, as it relates to hanging there. Um, and I mean, there's so much to say about how work gets installed in the rotunda. Um, for me, I think that 
I very consciously from the beginning recognized a few things about the rotunda space that I felt one must contend with. Um, the ascent to the top. And that's kind of the immediate thing that I thought about um, and how the fact that in the kind of ascent to, to the oculus, to the top of the building, um, how that ascent could carry with it this kind of teleological understanding of art history. And it's no surprise that um, in the case of retrospectives in particular, you have this kind of chronology beginning of a life to the end. Um, and so what do you make of the fact that there's a natural teleology embedded within the architecture? Um, and coming from some, coming from my academic background of African-American studies, which um, shapes the way that I think uh, in every way, um, I've always resisted teleology <laughs> and um, prefer something much more rhizomatic. And um, so from the very beginning, I will say that I kind of made a decision that it was not going to be chronological, that it would follow these, um, uh, a kind of thematic outline. Um, so that was one thing. Um, on the other hand, there were these moments of kind of leaning into the natural architecture as a, as a way of giving the exhibition its shape. Um, and uh, one of those key things is what you're seeing here on the screen um, is, is what we call internally at the museum a bay. So the segmented structure of um, the rotunda where you have these kinds of mini room moments. Um, and so one of the key features of the exhibition too um, is that each artist is given at least one bay that is their own and gets constituted in these different kinds of ways depending on what it is that um, the work requires or the artist desires. We're looking at um, work by Farah al Kasimi, and in her case, um, using wallpaper, video. Um, in other cases, you have grid work, um, so on and so forth. And what I really, you know, the, I guess to me, it felt like a very logical choice. Um, and it is following the logic of the building. It's also following the logic of a group show where you kind of have to think about how all of these, um, different artists relate to one another. But, um, what I didn't expect in that, uh, in that process is that it, in the final presentation, you really, I think, um, feel these works as these kinds of individual solo show moments within a larger whole, which I think is nice, being able to kind of walk in and out and have um, a um, private, uh, intimate moment um, with each artist. And that's always a challenge of the group show. How do you ensure that artists are given, you know, their full space and um, and uh, the gravity of their work comes across um, in this relational uh, exhibitionary context. And I think there's something really nice about that, that Bay structure. A few more things, cause this is a very, this is a very critical- <laughs> Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> yes, um, and it's, I backing up, I mean, this show, the art, the layout of the show was emergent with the concept of the show, which I think is really critical um, to think about um, with this question of the architecture, because at the time that I was developing the show, I was sitting at the museum offices in those models, you know, a work would come to mind and amazing exhibition designer Nazani Naimi would you know, make me the scale and go straight into the model and think about it in relation to the space from the very beginning. It wasn't like there was a checklist that was then uh, mapped onto the rotunda. Um, so I hope that you can really feel this sense of um, cohesion around that point. Um, I don't want to talk forever about this. So one more thing that I am going to say, though, is that back to that um, question of uh, uh, eschewing chronology. Um, I was actually just thinking about that this morning and there's actually something quite, instead of 
chronological, photological about the exhibition in that you are moving up towards the light um, that is the Oculus on that final floor. And those, for those who have seen the show, um, uh, you will know um, that on that final ramp, I very intentionally am thinking about light and perception as the conceptual driver of that space, um, which was already a part of the show, but I think reaches um, a new kind of meaning um, in the context of the rotunda space where the Oculus, you know, makes that um, a matter of, um, a physical matter actually, uh, dealing with natural light that is coming in. So yeah, I'll, I'll end mm. that. Mm. You've given me so much to think with and, and respond to. Um, first, to this point of teleology, I mean, it's interesting to think about when you organize a, an exhibition that eschews teleology and chronology, um, right? It also eschews this, uh, it, it, it instantiates or necessitates um, new ways of seeing, right? Because teleology is associated with a kind of like foresight or an ability to see into or through um, or towards a kind of determined future. So what happens when all of that becomes messed up and when we are um, when we are left with a conversation that is intergenerational, that does not move through a, a telos um, that is sort of um, predetermined temporally, spatially, um, what have you. And I'll come back to that question of intergenerationality later. Um, and then with this this question of the bays as well, um, this was really something that I was trying to think through um, as I was writing about the exhibition. And um, I came to, um, it all sort of came to a head with um, the installation of the sort of monumental Lorna Simpson painting um, on the fifth floor, um, which we are, we're seeing here. Um, um, and the title is escaping me right now, but um, what I really appreciate about this moment in the exhibition is that um, our bodies have to kind of like renegotiate our relationship to the space, right? We have to step behind the wall. We have to sort of participate in this project of being shrouded or hiding or kind of realigning our bodies with something that is, um, right, that does not answer to light or legibility or being seen. Um, and as you so wonderfully explained during the walkthrough, um, this installation tactic was um, a sort of like necessary consequence of the material of um, the painting, um, which couldn't, um, I think as, as you said, um, it can't really hold up to that much light. Um, and so it's interesting to think about like what happens when the material conditions of the work are demanding you to think differently um, or to think anew about um, the content of the show, the thesis of the exhibition. Um, Anyways, I won't ramble on too much. Um, but then, then finally, um, the, the third thing with this um, sort of photological um, apparatus of the museum, um, so many friends um, who have accompanied me on like walks with, through the Guggenheim or talked about the Guggenheim with them um, have compared the Guggenheim to a sort of panopticon, um, which is a kind of imprecise metaphor, but um, it, the 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 spatial logic of the museum is really one of like you, you can observe your fellow visitors as they're walking up the rotunda on that path of ascension and then you get to the top and you're afforded this um you're afforded a view um that is not only lateral but also vertical um so yeah the tactics of of seeing that the museum um that the architecture of the museum is sort of forcing one to negotiate with um, really just so eloquently foregrounds all of the questions that that going dark is asking. Um, so this is not a, a question, just some some thoughts that I have. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering if you have any responses to that. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think I can say that I in, I know that Okay, <laughs> I get really excited about an exhibition idea when um, 
yeah, when it's when there's an artist list, there's a works list where um, the thesis feels really tight, but then the work is really varied. And then you can kind of tell like, oh, this is going to be a good group show. Um, and so I was excited about that in the making of Going Dark, but I also, um, in thinking about the Rotunda, um, felt early on that there was this additional layer that the architecture of the building um, brought forth um, in precisely what you're saying, in the fact that you are made to participate in the kind of look over the glance, um, the uh, the various angles at which you can um, uh, see a work, um, the overlook um, on the sixth floor. And so this, the dynamics of looking are so um, alive and so um, full at the Guggenheim that yes, it becomes a particularly um, uh, a particularly resonant place to stage questions of looking, and um, that's part of the reason why I reached out to American artists about doing a work um, for the show. And Americans' work, um, I won't reveal too much about what um, what it consists of, but it takes up quite specifically um, the Panopticon, um, uh, the architecture of surveillance um, as it relates to the museum and thinking about that fact that you are always kind of exposed at the Guggenheim in, right. in the unraveling of the gallery space. Um, and yeah, what, what do we make of that exposure? Yeah, and and that that work in particular, I mean, what's striking about it is I didn't notice the um the sort of eye that's watching that American has installed um that watches over the museum until I actually got to um the the sort of locus in the exhibition where you enter their installation um and all of it is sort of set into motion. Um, but as you said, I won't, I don't want to reveal, I don't want to spoil that exhibition too much for um, those who haven't seen it. Um, but my next question, um, we've talked a lot about how the exhibition changes um, the, the sort of architecture of looking. Um, this question for me felt really imbricated in how the exhibition changes the architecture of reading as well. Um, and the sort of literary imagination um, is um, foregrounded um, throughout. So um, the catalog begins with, with a quote by John Keats, um, who writes in Ode to a Nightingale, Darkling, I Listen, which I thought was interesting, um, uh, not only because it, it involves literature, but also because it attunes us to the auditory register rather than the visual register. Um, so I, I was immediately thinking about um, how the, the quote in the exhibition itself um, um, solicits a kind of multi-sensory attunement. Um, and then um, Ellison's Invisible Man is really looming over several of the works, um, right? It shows up in the titles of um, Ming Smith, um, and Carrie James Marshall, um, and then just the sort of thematics of the novel, um, right? Um, sort of fly black a blackness that that um, flies under the radar, um, or that is made to operate under the radar because of the conditions of racial capitalism. Um, that felt like it was um, really texturing the argument of the show. Um, and then the title for Dawood Bay's Night Coming Tenderly Black is famously called from Langston Hughes's Dream Variations. Um, and then finally, there's also um, a, a more literal textual presence in works like Timepiece by Lorna Simpson, um, where we have these four, um, four figures um, with their backs turned to us, um, and it's framed by um, by a text, a sort of an almost funerary text, um, um, offering a sort of litany of, of deaths. Um, and we can see it um, timepiece in the background here on the slide. Um, 
So the literary and the textual are doing quite important work in shaping the contours of the exhibition critique, um, its visual critique. Um, and I wanted to just ask how you were thinking about the literary imagination in relation to the questions that the exhibition raises, um, and also what stakes does this exhibition raise for literature itself um, and for the question of, of legibility, which might be the sort of like um, uh, the commensurate um, word that we're thinking with. If, if, if in art we're thinking about um, making things visible and literature it's making things legible. Um, and then I, I know you have a background in, in literature and got your PhD in English. And so I thought this would be a particularly appropriate question to, to think through. Um, but yeah, wondering if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a really great multifaceted question. Um, and one that I don't, I don't, yeah, I can't answer in all of the ways because partially I, I, literature is so deep within me that I don't even, <laughs> I can't separate my thoughts from it, which oh. is partially where I thought to begin to answer the question because um, I absolutely see literature as theory. And um, in the case of Ellison, Invisible Man as a theoretical text that becomes a touchstone, not just thematic, but theoretical for um, artists across media um, discipline. Um, and in terms of kind of like the embeddedness of that, when I was making the show, I, I wasn't consciously thinking about Ellison's Invisible Man. I've obviously read it. Um, uh, but it it wasn't coming to the fore as kind of um, something that it, it's not where I drew the concept in a, a in an explicit way, but it organically came to the fore because so many artists were thinking about Ellison, and I love moments like that because it reflects on it reflects to me that interconnectedness of the arts that feels so so palpable to me and reflective of how I think about the arts and how I um, have, have approached my own academic career, but when that organically comes from um, uh, uh, the putting together of um, artists and their works on their own. So it, for me, it was like Invisible Man was something that I could not ignore because that's the story. That is that is the art history of um, so many of these artists. Um, and then the question of text um, more broadly and um, legibility is uh, a critical term. Um, the the language of description I think is um, is another and. In the case of Lorna's work, um, those the text that lives alongside of the images are um, are not captions, playing with the aesthetic of the caption, but um, refuting it and um, driving towards something that's more um, uh, elusive, um, which can be thought alongside of um, elusive and associative. And what her what that work makes me think about is that there is a kind of parallel conversation that can be had around the textual, the literary, the descriptive, where um, there is a kind of um, liberation or power to be seen in the um, in the refusal to fully describe. Um, to accurately describe or to even put down in writing at all. Um, and like, what does it mean to kind of um, write at the edges and around and circumvent? And um, I think that that is, that is a kind of parallel discourse that happens in, in the literary world um, in a kind of just like a postmodernist context. Um, though I think in, in the context of Going Dark, um, there's something about 
the scopic. It's like that is <laughs> the regime of the scopic is where all the shit goes down. Like that is actually, <laughs> uh, that's, that's, you know, you mentioned racial capitalism. It is, that is how we structure our, our worlds. Um, and so I think that there's this hold of the visual um, that, language and questions of writing I don't think we'll ever necessarily have to kind of contend with in the same way that um we do with sight and uh yeah that's mm -hmm. that's where that question leads me for now mm -hmm. at least um yeah. I I love this first the connection between allusion and illusion I love that um and then and then yeah of course this is really an exhibition about what does going dark do to open up new conditions of possibility for liberation um, from the scopic and its attendant regimes of um, of epistemic sort of ordering and dominance and domination and subjugation. Um, and what I really appreciate um, about seeing this as like a young person who is grappling with um, what does it mean to, you know, um, work in museum spaces or um, curate? Um, how is it that I can, um, you know, hold these, these hold a truth um, and a, a commitment to um, opacity as informed by Glissant and all these other Black thinkers um, and then produce um writing art writing museum writing etc um and i wanted to ask um how you as a curator were sort of holding these things in the balance um how were you negotiating the tension between making the exhibition um legible um to a public um making it sort of coherent um making it you know, readily under making its argument um, readily understandable, um, while also sort of like um, attending to this credo of opacity um, and 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 heeding its call. You know, that's a really that's a really great question, and it reminds me of um, it reminds me of graduate seminar because <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> in graduate school that would come up all the time, kind of like. Um, how does your writing reflect the theory of that of which you're writing? Um, and like, does it need to? And um, how do you, how can um, academic writing, uh, I think of somebody like Fred Moten, kind of uh, a density that, um, yeah, that eludes, clarity and legibility for the sake of resist like as a resistance right. um and this this answer might surprise you but <laughs> i i'm truly um i i am not a um form follows theory kind of girl when it comes to the exhibition context i think no matter what show um whether or not it takes up um the question of opacity or legibility explicitly, I'm very interested in legibility and accessibility at all times. Mm -hmm. um, I fully believe in um, uh, didactic texts, wall texts as serving a public um, and the importance of that language being accessible. Um, I believe in wall labels. <laughs> That's not necessarily um, an ideology that's shared amongst all curators or institutions. You know, there are museums where that there are no wall labels on the wall. And I, um, I have a background in education, which I somewhat um, kind of call on as um, cause for why I feel that way. But I don't know if it's just that. I I think that everyone who enters a museum space should have the opportunity to um, hold on to something. And uh, you can refute that if you want. You don't have to read um, the wall labels, but I'm going to make them. Um, and it's, 
yeah, it's something that is important to me. And it's something that's actually quite fun for me. I really like uh, the challenge of uh, distilling meaning into um, into uh, compact compact language. Um, so yeah, I there is no connection between <laughs> the wall text and the the thematic. In fact, if anything, it's um, if anything, it's in it's in contention, perhaps. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I I love the complexities that that um, allows us to hold. Um, there doesn't have to be a coherence between um, you know form and theme. Um, and and speaking of of um, of sort of giving people something to hold on to, the exhibition comes with this fabulous, beautifully made catalog um, that I've had the pleasure of returning to um, in preparation for our, our conversation. Um, and I, I wanted to take a few minutes to dive into this as well. Um, it's just such a, first of all, um, the paper I want to talk about um, briefly, um, it's it's rendered on tracing paper, which is hard to see on the screen, but um, it has the effect of um, um, allowing you to see through um, onto the next page, um, which felt like such an interesting reversal of of the of the the terms of the exhibition, which um, you know. If we're talking about opacity um, in in the artwork, um, we're we're talking quite literally about transparency um, in the pages, both in terms of um, the the literal material of the pages and in terms of um, a kind of distillation, as you said, of the ideas um, that are embedded in the exhibition. Um, it's also just such a wonderful chorus of, of voices. We have um, your wonderful introduction, um, a great essay by Legacy Russell. Um, we have poems. Um, and, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how you approach the assembling of the catalog. Um, and then also how you're thinking about the, the legacy of um, the exhibition as it might live in this, in this fabulous book. Yes, thank you. Um, I love the catalog so much. Um, designed, as you can see, by Fahad Alhunaif, who is um, Kuwait-based right now. Um, amazing designer. Um, very early on in the making of the show, I said to myself, um, or I don't know, I, I determined that I wanted the catalog to as much as possible be an extension of the exhibition as opposed to just kind of like a record of it. And um, in choosing Fahad to design it, he got that so clearly um, from the very beginning. And you can see on this image as you speak to that um, semi-transparent paper, thinking about layering and thinking about these questions of discernment and legibility um, even through the gesture of um, this, uh, the flourish of the, of the, what you call the tracing paper, um, it becomes an experience uh, that is replicable in the, in the process of reading the text. Um, and hopefully one feels that resonance between what it, felt like to lean into uh, you know, Carrie James Marshall's black painting and having to use your body and strain to see, and then going to the catalog and and turning the page and feeling that you are also implicated in this process of looking. Um, and so extension of the show in terms of the um in terms of the table of contents and how that came together, um, you know, called on the all-star all -star <laughs> group to come together to contribute essays. Um, I, you know, I, as, as we've mentioned, academic background. So um, I called on the people who I knew would bring some theory um, to bear on their, on their essays and, um, yeah, Abby Schreiber, you mentioned Legacy, Ayana Dozier, Jordan Carter, Kijo Lee, um, just 
amazing, amazing contributions. Um, it's, I hope that it is a text that can be read um, across art historical contexts. Um, obviously I'm always thinking about black studies. Um, you know, I hope that there's something to be found in the college classroom, in the grad, in the grad classroom. Um, and uh, the accessibility of the language was important in that sense. And then I'll just um, also say that whenever I can uh, in the visual arts context, going back to your question about literature, I always love to bring in um, poetry, which is within literature um, kind of was my specialization um, in grad school and, uh, and, and also personal love. And um, so being able to include poets as well, because um, going back to that question of, um, or not that, that idea of extending the exhibition into the catalog space, I was really thinking about the fact that going dark is a concept that obviously um, can resonate outside of the visual arts proper. Um, and in that sense, how can a poet think through these concepts? Um, and then how can graphic designers also think through this concept? And I thought, um, being able to include uh, those voices as well was just kind of like a special um, going dark plus, like, <laughs> you know, you just get like a little added, um, I love a coda and there's a coda, <laughs> I love that so much. And she's a coda, I don't know, it's like yeah. never, <laughs> I never yeah. had to change. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful book and I'm not just saying that because it's my show, but um yeah yeah it just is I mean it's it's also just so pleasurable to um to flip through and and look at the way it's assembled and um yeah the, the design is just um really stunning um and and I I do really love that it flits between um different disciplines, different discourses, um, that it dips into poetry feels like such an important way of, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think poets are really doing the work of um, always thinking that Dion Brand says, um, poetry is always abstract, even when it's narrative poetry. Um, and in that sense, um, poetry is the medium that I, I always associate with um, right, maintaining my sort of right to opacity. Um, and, and it's just, I'm, I was just so glad to see poems by Harmony and Kevin. Um, um, speaking of, um, uh, the, the catalog, one of the really wonderful flourishes is also that it assembles, uh, much like the exhibition, um, an intergenerational, um, uh, sort of chorus of voices. Um, and we spoke about this a little bit earlier as you were talking about the sort of telos of the building. Um, but I wanted to take some time to dive into this question of intergenerationality a bit more. Um, so we we start the exhibition with um, Sandra Mujinga, and then um, when, when we exit from her installation, um, we're immediately met with um, Faith Ringgold, um, and Sandra is, is, I think, the youngest participant in the exhibition, or one of the youngest, um, and then Faith is one of the oldest, um, and then as we um, reach the top of the spiral, um, we have, right, Carrie James Marshall and Sandra Perry are sort of ending, closing things out. Um, so again, there's this, this intergenerational pairing happening. Um, and I wanted to ask you why, why a um, kind of temporal stretch was um, important for you in, in thinking about the theme of the exhibition. Um, and the title is the, the Contemporary Figure at the Edge of Visibility. Um, so to that end, wondering how you were thinking about the contemporary figure, um, given the sort of intergenerational thrust of the exhibition. And here we have Charles White, who um, is, is you know, no longer with us. And um, right, just thinking about the valence of, of 
the term contemporary, how it's stretching here, how it's operating? Yeah, yeah, the intergenerational question is important to me, I think on a structural level, as much as I can in the making of an exhibition. Um, if, if there is the potential for an inter intergenerational dialogue, I will always choose it, even if I won't like synthetically make that be the case. Though I will say with this show, I mean, because the concept is so broad in some ways, this could have been a strictly, you know, work from, I don't know, from 2000 to the present or something like that, or even 2010, um, and easily filled the entire rotunda because I do feel like um, the this question of evasion um, is such a salient one for young artists, especially, um, I think for, you know, for obvious reasons, like in a heavily surveilled, um state this how we redetermine our um or regain control over our autonomy and and so forth um becomes um an an acute question um that being said um the way that this sh this iteration of going dark because you know conceivably there could be a different one um I set the chronology from the 1980s to the present um, because again, that seemed to be where the art history was leading me. Um, Carrie James Marshall and Lorna Simpson are my kind of like two initiators um, mm -hmm. of, of this legacy, um, both making work, the work that's included in the show um, in the mid 1980s. And I kind of make an argument that mid I mean, it, it's the mid 1980s, it's the 1980s because these are artists who are taking all of, um, all that they've learned from the legacies of the 70s um, and the 60s around um, the conceptual possibilities of a work of art um, and um, kind of reconstituting what questions a work of art can um, can open up or answer. Um, and then thinking about the rise of identity and identity politic language and um, discourse in the 80s. And so it becomes this re really fertile time to then take up identity um, through these kinds of conceptual gestures. Um, and that is how the body becomes um, uh, a kind of experimental space to work through this question of um, visibility. Uh, and then, because I like, could not stop, <laughs> um, there are these three, what I call the throwbacks of um, uh, in the show, Faith Ringgold, Charles White, um, and David Hammonds, which um, going back to the question of architecture, uh, kind of form a vertical column because they close out um, the end of their sections um, as a kind of, um, as a way of calling back the fact that even as I think it's, it is the 1980s where it becomes like a, not a movement, but I think um, uh, at least like a contingent and um, uh, yeah, a, a coming together of um, in a, in a particular way around, around this concept of visibility. Um, there are these moments in the late 1960s, I think, where artists were uh, predecessors and um, working through these in these kinds of discrete cases. Um, so that felt important too. And let me, one more thing I just want to say too, is that on that question of the intergenerational um, uh, point is that the intergenerational conversation is important to me in general, but I, I, was aware of the fact that working in um, the Guggenheim specifically, um, that it was important for me to have a show that didn't skip through history, but, oh. at, but went back a little bit um, because, you know, we know, given what we know about Guggen Guggenheim's history and 
who has and has not been visible um, in the space, it felt like a, um, an important opportunity to not skip a step, but to include some of these earlier voices. Um, and yeah, and so that my personal politics aligned with the, the, um, the, yeah, the, the logic of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Has, I mean, has Faith Ringgold been shown in the Guggenheim before? So mm -hmm. she has not, though, oh. <laughs> though oh. we own, um, um, perhaps what, uh, Tar Beach, probably her most famous, mm -hmm. um, so it's been seen in many other places. Um, so that's to come. <laughs> wow. Okay. Thinking about that. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's just huge to, it really is a, a rupture and, and a reckoning to um, be able to, again, to generate the conditions um, in which voices that have heretofore been excluded from that space um, are, are included in an exhibition that is um, talking about visibility. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it again goes back to that paradox of desired visibility versus enforced visibility um, that is sort of running through the themes you're drawing out. Um, I also, I mean, what's so tender about this exhibition is, is seeing the dialogues that are unfolding between the younger artists and the older artists. And um, you mentioned that, like, for example, um, John Edmonds was, um, at one point working with Lyle Ashton Harris um, or working for him and now they're together in this show and um, it, it's it's really it's quite a, a an affectively striking um, part of the exhibition. Um, you talked also about um, the sort of like particular situation of um, the 80s where you're having um, the discourse of identity politics emerge. Um, we're also kind of um, falling quickly on the heels of the um, deconstruction movement and thinking, yeah, there's 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 a lot of kind of discursive tentacles that are emerging um, in the 80s. Um, and I want to think about also the kind of particular um, art historical discursive situation that we're in now, um, which is one in which, um, of course, a Black figurative portraiture is doing so well um, in the market um, and in museums um, and is becoming um, really at the sort of foreground perhaps of um, um, at least in, in, in terms of sales. It seems like um, most of the sales of Black artists are in um, figurative work. Um, there was a great analysis that came out in Freeze like just a month ago by John baptiste Odor um, on the, the politics of Black figurative art today. Um, and so I was thinking about all of these things as, as I was moving through the exhibition um, and wondering how how going dark sort of speaks to or rubs against this moment that we're in where Black figurative art is um, so hyper visible to use Hartman's terms. Um, how might this exhibition sort of expand and rethink our understanding of what Black figuration can do, what its politics are? I mean, here we're here we're looking at one of the only works in the exhibition that excludes anything to do with a figure or figuration. Um, but you know, again, to go back to your um, that wonderful. Um, dovetailing of illusion and allusion, many of the works seem to allude to a figure um, without explicitly, like, um, explicitly showing a figure. Um, and yes, so, you know, we talked about the contemporary in the title. I, now I'm, I'm curious to know more about the, the figure, the figure um, as it appears in the title and in the exhibition. Yeah, I, um, in terms of the question of the market and um, the uptick in, uh, yeah, market sales around figuration, um, it's it's one that I anticipated <laughs> in yeah. the reception of the show, um, and um, yeah, because there's 
there are so many wonderful figurative artists having great success right now. Um, Jordan Castile, Amy Sherald, like these great painters. Um, and it's funny, I, I actually had a conversation with Richard Armstrong before he retired about this um, because he brought that up actually. He was like, do you think that, do you think that, um, that the press or other other um, audience members will see it as a kind of referendum on uh, the rise of black figuration. And I said, I truly hope not. Um, for one, it's certainly not where my mind intentionally was um, thinking in terms of situating it as such. Um, I, yeah. Uh, so full stop, I'll just end it on that note for that point. But then secondarily in reflecting on it, um, I said to him, as I feel, as, as I still feel now, that if anything, I see it as a, um, I see it in conversation and in, in support and um, expansion of the criticality around black figuration. Um, part of what, I, I mean, I've always felt this way about figuration and abstraction that oftentimes um, those are understood as dichotomous and in opposition to one another. And I believe in a much more porous understanding of that boundary. Um, I've kind of always felt that way. And um, I, it's not even, yeah, I wasn't even self-consciously pursuing it as such with this show, but Again, logically, when you think about um, the uh, the precept of the exhibition, which is going dark, um, artists who are attempting to obscure as in many cases as close they can get to the edge of visibility, um, it means that they um, are brought to these spaces of abstraction, just like as a matter of cause. And so living at the edge between figuration and abstraction then can reflect on um, that which is further from that center point. Um, and, and in so doing, one can understand that there are always kind of shared strategies and that we can understand figuration abstraction on a kind of continuum as a, a, rather than oppositionally. And then as such, going back to your question about um, the market and black figuration, my hope, if anything, would be what are the ways that we can complicate the discourse around what these artists are doing? Is black figuration even a, um, even a, um, is that a coherent category? Um, are there some different terms that we can use to describe what we think we're doing when we talk about black figurative artists? Um, is Amy Sherrill doing the same work as Jordan Castile? And what does, you know, new language afford us in better understanding the complexity of all artists' visions and particularly figurative artists too? So I, if anything, I see it as like an opening up, um, mm -hmm. um, certainly not a refutation. Yeah, yeah, I, I really, appreciate and we'll hold that um because i i've been emerging into this moment where i'm 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 i'm, I'm struggling so much with um yeah the i don't know we'll save that conversation for later but um but, but um I, I i really appreciate what you just said um uh, the, there's a third, a third sort of titular element that I want to ask you about, which is, um, and this will be my last question because I want to make sure that um, we have time for um, questions from the audience. Um, but the the going and going dark. Um, this is something that I brought up in my review. Um, the exhibition um, is really as as much about. Um, motion as it is about um, these kind of dimensions of of shadows and um, uh, I don't know spectatorship, light and dark. Um, when we think about black fugitivity um, alongside these discourses discourses of opacity, um, right to be a fugitive is to be 
in sort of absconding motion. Um, and we see we see again and again um, in works by Sandra Perry, for example, um, or Sandra Mujinga, once again, um, an attention to the body in flight. Um, and then there's also an emphasis on our own bodies moving up and through the exhibitory space. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about how you are thinking about motion in relation to darkness, um, going in relation to the shadows. Um, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, that's all there, uh, fugitivity, um, the blur and Ming Smith, that's, that's probably another example that comes up. Um, yeah, Ascension, yes. Um, I, yeah, I think that that's definitely all there, though I will admit that, well, this is, okay, let me say two things. <laughs> um, uh, my former professor and, uh, you know, I don't know, advisor and uh, person that I look up to, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Alexander, um, said something in grad school that has always stuck with me, which is that um, the poem is always smarter than the poet. And I think the mm. same for artworks and artists, and I think the same for exhibitions and curators. Um, and uh, so I like, I hold all of those things and more because the hope is that if like, if the, if the concept is, if you're being honest and true in the making of something, then it's going to unfold in ways that you can anticipate. Um, but in my anticipation around going, one of the critical reasons why I liked going dark as a um, as a formulation is that I was really thinking about um, material and making and artists like going dark, like how do they actually literally make these things disappear, make these things illegible, um, erase, um, just a kind of a very active understanding of, of art making. And which is part of like my goal in, um, in back to that question about figuration, it's like, there's such experiment and uh, possibility radicality in the studio around these works that are, that's kind of like inspiring in itself, aside from the conceptual work that the, um, the artworks are doing. So the going as a reminder of like the material and I'm a materialist in every sense of the, in every sense of the word. And um, so yeah, that, that's also part of the going um the process the process of making mm. the poem is always smarter than the poet that's mm, brilliant I love that formulation and I loved your answer to that question um yeah I'm 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 just so grateful for um your illumination um, or <laughs> no pun intended um your illumination of these um concepts and ideas and of um, um just grateful for the exhibition itself it really um it is one of those exhibitions that i i think is going to have a serious legacy on the way that i see and the way that many people see and um also the possibilities the discursive possibilities that it opens up it really just has set the tone for so much to come. Um, and I am so grateful to you and to all the artists included in the exhibition for um, doing what you do. Um, and with that, I will open it up to the audience for questions um, with one more resounding thank you, Ashley. Um, and thanks to everyone in the audience for listening. No, thank you, Zoe. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Ashley. Um, that was such a pleasure to listen to. Um, we do have a couple of audience questions, so I will pass it over to a few members of the audience. The first question is going to be from Gilberto. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. I'm sorry, Gilberto, if I'm, if I'm not. Yes. Hi. Hi. I'm going to mute even though I'm a little crusty right now, but thank you both so much. This was so lovely. Um, now just get right into it. Um, 
So themes of the erotic came up um, in the works of Tiana and Carrie James Marshall and, and Joy D. Um, and I know that's something that you were thinking about as well. I saw on the, on the um, uh, kind of wall description. There's also an erotic kind of undertone to the exhibition's title as well. Um, and I was just thinking about, um, was it something you were intentional about bringing to the exhibition? Um, and I guess, could you talk us through sort of how you were conceptualizing the erotic in relationship to Going Dark? Yeah, I think, hmm, I think that that's a good example of following the lead of where the topic, the theme, the, yeah, the ideas take you um, in, yeah, I, and I can't even, I'm, I'm not even sure if I'm able to articulate it as a conscious thing um, because it it feels so logical for that to be um yeah for that to follow a discourse around um the opportunities of opacity um and then reflecting on how artists uh make that explicit in various to various degrees um yeah, yeah, I think it, overall, I I think I had in mind like political, social visibility uh, in, in the senses of kind of um, representational politics and surveillance. And um, there were kind of these like large uh, headline topics that I was concerned with. Um, and then under that is just like an unfolding of every iteration that can come um, thereafter. And I think the erotic is, even if it wasn't one that I um, would name as like uh, at the top of my mind um, in the original formulation of the exhibition is certainly within it. And um, when Tiana made new work, it, it meant like going to Tiana, who I knew considered the erotic in her work. And when she made new work for the show, um, made it quite explicit through the archive that she was engaging with. And so again, it's one of those things where it's like, it's it's there, you then ask the artist that you know has some relationship to this question and then they um, bring it to fruition in a way that I couldn't have anticipated even, so. Amazing question and really generous answer. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, the next question is from GE and I think this will be our last question. GE, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Thank you so much and thank you for this wonderful show and thank you for this conversation. Uh, could you speak a bit to the power of epiphany to be a sort of a profound illumination of authentic modes of identity? It seems to be running all through the show that way. Um, epiphany, can you repeat? I'm sorry, I don't think I fully understood. Yeah, no, the... epiphany, can you, can you, can you speak, uh, can you speak to the, the power of epiphany to be uh, really a profound illumination or illuminator, you know, of uh, authentic uh, modes of identity? Hmm. Um, hmm. Yes. <laughs> I want to say that I agree. <laughs> um yeah epiphany and the epiphanic um yeah i i guess where that might draw me is is kind of thinking about encounter and um architecturally going back to the museum and and you kind of like the turning of the corner and um almost the flip side of what we were talking about in terms of the surveillance aspect like if on the one hand you're you um there seems to be this tension between the exposure that the um the layered uh exposed unraveled gallery space allows that means that you can never fully hide um but then perhaps that means that in these moments where there is there is hiding available 
that can lead to a an ex specific kind of experience. And I think that that is what's kind of interesting about the segmented architecture of the building. It's like you're moving in and out and you have these opportunities of turning around, go back to the Lauren Simpson specific notation, um, which has its own epiphany, um, is that it's in, in this architecture of exposure, um, surprise becomes that much more felt, um, bodily felt uh, when it happens. Um, yeah, I can't say that I was intentionally thinking about that, but I, I think that that is, that seems right. That seems true. It's one of those things I think is so in it. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, GE. Um, thank you so much for that question. And thank you for your answer, Ashley. Um, I think that's going to conclude our Q&A portion today. Those are both really great questions. Thank you all for, for your questions today. Um, and I'm going to pass the mics back over to Ashley and Zoe to close us out with a reading today. Actually, which of are you, are we both reading? No, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to read. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> this was, this was an impromptu decision that was made in the like 10 minutes before we went live. Um, but I'm going to read a poem by um, Louise Glick, who passed away um, shortly before Going Dark opened. So her poems were really on my mind um, as I began thinking about the exhibition and when I was writing my review and um, I reread a bunch of her work. Um, and so I'm going to be reading um, Bats. Okay, it says Bats by Louise Glick. There are two kinds of vision, the seeing of things which belongs to the science of optics versus the seeing beyond things which results from deprivation. Man, mocking the dark, rejecting worlds you do not know, though the dark is full of obstacles, it is possible to have intense awareness when the field is narrow and the signal is few. Night has bred in us, thought more focused than yours, if rudimentary. Man, the ego, man imprisoned the eye. There is a path you cannot see beyond the eye's reach, what the philosophers have called the via negativa. To make a place for light, the mystic shuts his eyes. Illumination of the kind he seeks destroys creatures who depend on things. Thank you. Wow. To make a place for light, the mystic shuts its eyes. I love it so much. Thank you so much, Zoe, for that reading. Thank you, Ashley. Um, thank you, both of you, for today's dialogue. It was incredible and such a pleasure to listen to. Thank you to Ivy. Um, at Guggenheim, who was so, so helpful in pulling together images ahead of today's event. Um, and thank you, of course, to the Terror Foundation for American Art, who sponsor our NSC program and make conversations like this one possible. They also support the Rails YouTube archive. Um, and if you're free on Monday, on President's Day, join us for a screening of Long Now Visits His Neighbors by Rikrit Tiravanya. Uh, you can register to receive a 24-hour access link to the film. And now um, we'll do that thing where we throw open the mics and everyone gets the chance to say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. And thank you again to Ashley and Zoe. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. It was, thank you. I enjoyed so it so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Question. <laughs> amazing conversation thank you thank you for the reading zoe it was perfect yeah, that was beautiful <laughs> thank you all so so much bye everybody bye, bye. Take Take care. Care. bye. bye.